periodicals. It's likely the majority of resources for the research project will come from periodicals, not books, TV, movies, YouTube videos, radio programs, or any other type of media. So what is a periodical? We can define them by looking at their shared characteristics, which are also among the reasons periodicals are so valuable to researchers. They are issued at regular intervals and usually consist of a collection of articles which may range from a single page story in a magazine to a 40 page study in a scholarly journal. On the same page, Indiana University lists these advantages of using periodicals. Because they are published frequently, periodicals are the best source for current information. Current events are usually discussed in periodicals long before they become the subject of a book. Periodicals often contain information on the latest trends, products, research, and theories. Periodicals are the best source for ephemeral or very specialized information. Periodicals exist for every field and every interest, providing access to a variety of hard to find information. Due to the shorter length of periodical articles, more topics may be covered within one volume of a periodical than in one book. Sensational periodicals are the ones that grab our attention at the checkout counter. They have flashy headlines or obviously retouched photos designed to shock us or arouse our curiosity, even though we know the stories are mostly untrue. They are usually in newspaper format because it's less expensive to publish. The stories are frequently salacious, rarely attributed to an authoritative writer, and try to convince readers the publication has some inside knowledge of a scandal or cater to common superstitions. Much of what's published is totally fabricated or based on flimsy facts that are intentionally misinterpreted. Sensational periodicals have no place in academic writing, even if they happen to contain an element of truth now and then. Regardless of one's politics or religion, there's likely a publication designed especially for the group. These are commonly known as special interest or advocacy publications. They can be as slick and professional as the best of the substantive news magazines, or they can be as vitriolic as the basest sensationalist publication. What they all have in common is that they promote, sometimes feverishly, a particular point of view. In doing so, they often cross the bounds of advocacy to propaganda or fanaticism. In approaching these publications as sources, it pays to consider David Weinberger's admonition that transparency is the new objectivity. What he means is it's vitally important to know who is providing the information and what particular point of view is held by the writer or publisher. It's impossible to be totally objective. So understanding the motivations of the author and publisher can help a researcher to more effectively evaluate the material. Special interest magazines can and do publish important, relevant information, and they can be quite useful to beginning researchers. However, their content is always framed to support the favored position or point of view. This means that special interest periodicals must be treated as if they are biased. If information is located in one of these, the facts and the interpretation of them must be carefully checked. Special interest periodicals rarely cite sources, but there may be clues in the text that can lead one to original sources. Popular periodicals are frequently fairly slick publications with lots of graphic appeal, short articles written in simplified language, 
and lacking in serious depth. Their main purposes are to entertain readers and to act as a vehicle for advertising. These publications may have a fairly specific intended audience, such as men or women in a certain income or age bracket, but they tend to avoid taking on serious subjects which might alienate their audience. Popular press publications can be quite helpful in cutting through the jargon of substantive news and scholarly publications, though. The writing in magazines like this is usually geared toward middle or high school reading skills, so it is much easier to understand than scholarly journals. The biggest problem, other than superficiality, is that information in popular periodicals may be second or third hand, and there are rarely any citations. This is true even of the news magazines, though there are sometimes clues in articles that can be helpful. Notice how often there are very short articles which have no byline, no attribution to a specific author. Those are not good choices for research essays. Substantive publications are a bridge between popular and professional. They tend to be graphically appealing and use many photographs and carefully designed illustrations, graphics, and charts. Their language is more complex and the articles tend to be longer and more in-depth. The articles frequently have bylines indicating a scholar or freelance writer being given credit for the story. This category of periodical is especially useful to the new researcher. Many of these publications have spent years developing reputations for quality. Articles are often written by experts or teams of highly qualified personnel. The articles are usually more in-depth than in popular press magazines, and they often have clues that will lead to the scholarly sources from which information was derived even if they don't always provide citations. They frequently use quotes from experts in the field under discussion too, and they are easier to understand than professional journals. They are geared toward a more educated audience than the popular press, but they are not specialty specific. For instance, Scientific American does have a scientific bent but it publishes articles from many disciplines, among them archaeology, engineering, medicine, astronomy, etc. While these publications carry advertising, it is less intrusive than popular press publications because the main purpose of periodicals in this category is to provide deeper information in a general manner to a broad audience of concerned citizens. Scholarly journals are written for scholars by someone who is already a scholar or researcher in the field, and the articles are reviewed by others in the discipline before they are published. That's called peer review. These journals assume the reader is highly educated, familiar with the field, and comfortable using the language and jargon common to the discipline. The journals often seem serious with articles many pages long and one article being completed before the next is begun. They often have charts and graphs, but they usually don't include a great many photographs or have many glossy pages. All of the articles in professional journals have citations which may be in the form of footnotes, bibliographies, works cited, references, or a combination depending upon the style guide requirements of the publication. The citations can be used to find additional information on the specific subject being examined. The main purpose of journals is to disseminate the findings of original research and experimentation to others who are studying in the same field. Scholarly journals are frequently published by an organization within a discipline but that's not a requirement. There are some fine scholarly publications done by universities and various government entities. Professional journals are of very high value to researchers 
including those who are just getting started. They do have one major drawback. They are written for the professional audience and may be extremely difficult for a layperson to understand. However, that doesn't mean they are impossible to understand, and the effort put in is worth the learning derived. When choosing sources, it's wise to completely ignore the sensational publications, to regard skeptically the special interest periodicals, to look to the popular press for ideas but not substance, and to rely more heavily on substantive and scholarly publications. So where does that put blogs and newspapers? Well, the truth is, both of those publication methods run the gamut from sensational to substantive. There are even a few scholarly blogs that have sprung up recently. You just need to be much more cautious when considering whether to use a newspaper article or a blog post. Blogs, in particular, are still in their infancy as a publication medium, and as they mature, some will earn respect for their quality. Since anyone can have a blog, though, it's even more important to evaluate the authors and publishers very carefully before using their information. Thank you.